What's up, Pax? How you doing? That's not bad. One more time with feeling. How are you doing? Thursday and you're at Pax. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty awesome. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Aaron Saduko. I am the founder and chief video game analyst uh, with The Terrible Fate. Any of you guys heard of us before? That, okay, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, we're very small, so it's okay if you haven't. Uh, we're an online publication that's dedicated just to analyzing and trying to better understand and appreciate the storytelling of video games. That's all we do. I'm here with my friends and colleagues, Jaron, RM Johnson, and CJ Thomas, um, to talk about a series of articles on the site that they're working on called Hero of Time. More generally, what we're going to be thinking about is fan fiction, the many uses of fan fiction, and how it may even be possible that by taking a certain approach to fan fiction, you can end up illuminating and better understanding the source material and fiction that inspired that work in the first place. So, a roadmap of what we're going to be doing here. I'm going to be talking with you for a little bit just about what fan fiction is, uh, some reasons why you might do it, uh, and why the kind of fan fiction uh, that we're working on on the site uh, has a kind of function that, while not necessarily novel for fan fiction, uh, I think is definitely underappreciated uh, in the common discourse about fan fiction these days. Uh, after that, Jared and CJ are going to be diving in and talking to you uh, about the process that they went through as they tried to construct a Zelda fan fiction. And then we're going to leave some time at the end for questions, uh, hopefully starting out in this room, and then afterwards, if you want to keep talking to us, we'll be hanging out outside. But we've got to start with a very easy question. What is fan fiction? Because uh, if we are going to be talking about this, we should have at least, you know, a, a, fair understanding about it going into it, right? So before we get into any kind of definition, I think it's fair to say that it's a very personal thing, fan fiction, right? Personal confession uh, for me, I actually, uh, as I started planning for this panel, I thought, oh man, how am I going to talk about fan fiction because I don't write fan fiction, that's not really something that I gravitate towards. And then I thought about it a little more and it occurred to me, actually, I grew up with a hell of a lot of Legos. And Legos are just fuel for all sorts of fan fiction. For me, it were Bionicles. Um, has anyone heard of Bionicles before? Played some Bionicles? All right, all right. More than have heard of us, that's good. Uh, <laughs> and so it occurred to me, uh, and I actually was able to dig up some of my old, uh, you know, OC for Bionicles. Because uh, I love those stories, I love the comics that LEGO put out, and I actually ended up creating my own. And I think that's kind of a common experience, that even if some of us tend to outgrow fan fiction in some sense, it's a very natural urge to exercise your imagination, at least as you're a child, growing up uh, engaging with stories and falling in love with stories. More formally, since we need some language to be able to talk about this, right, we're going to be talking about fan fiction as a story that an author has created using characters, timelines, or setting from someone else's work of fiction. And that other work of fiction is going to be called the source fiction, right? So if you want an example that you might be familiar with, um, Alphys from Undertale uh, is very interested in fan fiction within the realm of the game. Undertale is also an apt example because besides discussing fan fiction inside of the game, there's so much fan fiction about Undertale. So that's going to get our discussion off the ground. Now that we have a sense of what fan fiction is, why would we create it, right? I think that like Alphys and Undertale, right, there's this strand of society that thinks Fan fiction is something that you only do if you're sort of a pariah or if you're on the outskirts of normalcy. Uh, and I think that's just not true. So in order to get into an understanding of why we might be doing fan fiction, it's important to parse out how it can actually be motivated by some very natural impulses, right? If you're a writer or someone who likes to create things, existing fictions can be an awesome writing prompt. Right? Or on the other hand, if you're really interested in a story, but you don't really like that one aspect of its plot, you can write a fan fiction that rectifies that, right? And gives you the story in the way that you wish it had gone, just so if the author doesn't end up going into a lot of detail about something that you really loved. Like, you know, it's a fantasy novel and they mention elves, but they don't really go into the lore. You can take the fan fiction to flesh out that aspect that really interested you. And of course, if you are personally connected to a story, what better way to enrich that connection than to write yourself into it. I don't think any of this is very othering. I think these are natural um, desires that we can all kind of relate to, right? But the focus of this, and on actually better understanding the source material uh, that fan fiction comes from, is sort of this fifth bucket of reasons why we might write fan fiction, which is to actually try to understand and better analyze the source text. This is what we're gonna be focusing on um, with this panel, and it's what CJ and Jaren focus on in their series, Hero of Time. 
So we're going to call this, uh, just as a matter of distinction, analytical fan fiction. Uh, and the key thing to note here is that it's geared towards providing everyone with a new understanding of its source fiction. So if you go back to that list I had quickly, right? As I said, these are all pretty natural impulses, but if you look at the first four, like I said at the outset, they're pretty deeply personal, right? And they're personal in the sense that oftentimes, if you look at someone else's fan fiction, you can recognize this definitely has personal meaning to you, and it might have helped you enrich your own relationship with the source fiction, but as an outsider, I'm not really gonna get a lot from it, right? So the idea behind this fifth thing, analytical fan fiction, is to say that actually, by thinking about it in relation to better understanding the source fiction, we can share it with anyone, they don't have to have written it, and they can share in that enhanced and enriched understanding of the source material just as much as the writers themselves can. It's easy to say that, but how could you actually do that, right? It seems like a tall order to just pick up a pen, start writing, and somehow create a work of fan fiction that lets you see the source fiction differently, right? I think a really interesting use case for this kind of analytical fan fiction, as the one that CJ and Jaren focus on, uh, is the notion of when you have a fictional series and you're trying to fill in a gap in the series, all right? So, uh, as an example that's near and dear to my heart, you know, Dishonored got a sequel, I think just last year at this point, time flies, um, and it picks up later on in the story, uh, you know, a decent chunk of time after the events of the first game. So there's a logical gap in the series, right? We know, as people who have played the series, that time had to pass and things had to happen in between the end of Dishonored 1 and the start of Dishonored 2. Uh, the question is, what happened? How can we understand that? How can we ultimately, hopefully, better understand both Dishonored and Dishonored 2 by getting a better understanding of what had to happen in the interim, and maybe even writing something about it. And that's the interesting thing, because I think the natural impulse for a lot of us when we see that kind of gap is to say, well, we won't know what happened in that gap until the author of the source fiction releases a story telling us what happened there. So if you're interested in Dishonored, you might be waiting on your hands for Arcade Studios to release something kind of explaining that gap. Um, but the idea behind analytic fan fiction is to say, well, actually, maybe we don't have to wait for an official story. An official new release from the developers might tell us what they're saying happens in that gap, but actually by turning our attention to just the existing content that we already have in the form of the entries in the series like Dishonored 1 and Dishonored 2, we can actually infer a lot of things about what has to have happened in that gap, and that can serve as the basis for crafting our own work of fan fiction to fill that gap. What are the tools that analytic fan fiction has to actually do this, right? I think the most obvious one uh, that probably comes to your mind first is just, you know, the matter of events in a series. So if you know about the events that happened in a certain game, uh, and then something happened in a gap, and then you have more events, it can be a matter of logic to figure out that there are certain things that have to have happened after the first game in order for the second game to logically follow, right? More interesting, you can also look to themes of the series. Right? So, of course, as video games tell stories, right, they're also able to, you know, represent pretty elaborate themes. But also, series of games are able to represent themes that are over multiple entries in the series, right? So think of trilogies, right? A trilogy is a very natural way of structuring a series of stories that reaches beyond any given one and actually gives you a broader thematic arc. Think of the original three Star Wars movies or something like this, right? So if you notice a thematic gap in the series, that can be just as telling as a uh, gap that's simply an event. So go back to our example of Dishonored to illuminate this for you. Um, just to point out one, one way that we can think about this, right? So in the first Dishonored, right, um, Corvo, your avatar, has the job, amongst other things, of protecting and hopefully saving um, this little girl princess, Emily Caldwin. Uh, jump to the events of Dishonored 2. Emily has gone from being a little girl um, to being the Empress, uh, a bit older uh, and a bit more established in that role even though she's still growing into it, right? So if we're thinking about these two tools that analytic fan fiction has, if we're trying to write a story about that gap, we can say, well, one thing that we know has to happen is Emily has to grow up, right? Which means that in fact she can't die in the first game, which is something that's possible for her to do. Uh, also, thematically, right, if we have this overarching theme of Emily kind of growing into her own and coming uh, to be an actual effective ruler versus the impressionable child whom we see in the first game, we might say that there's a thematic gap where we actually, you know, see what happens to Emily that forces her to have a coming of age where she's able to grow into that role. 
So already we've identified two kinds of gaps that an analytical fan fiction story could fill and actually end up teaching us more about the series. There's a third tool I think that analytical fan fiction has at its disposal um, when we're talking uniquely about video games, and that's about the experience of the player. Obviously it's easy to say, oh, video games are interactive, that has a big influence on their story, yada, 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 but I think there's actually a specific and really interesting way where if you're thinking about a series of video game stories, right, and that series is intended to draw in the same players over time, we can actually say that there's a certain onus on the series to grow up or mature or at least change over time uh, in a way that reflects the players changing over time. So let me give you a, a little brief toy argument to that conclusion. Basically, I'm going to make two pretty obvious observations, I think, uh, about gaming and just the way that we are as people, and then we're going to see that from that it follows that series need to develop in some way with the people who are playing them. Here's the first observation, right? If you think about the choices available to you in a game, right, it had better be the case that those choices, in some aspect, reflect choices that you would actually make in real life, right? If the choices that your avatar is able to make are just so bizarre and outlandish that the player would never even conceive of them, it's not clear how the player would be able to either A, identify that that's a choice that's available to them in the first place, or B, even if they are able to literally identify that choice, make any sense of how it contributes to the broader themes and broader economy of the game's story, right? So I think in some way, uh, the avatar choices need to be responsive to what the player sees as choices. Here's another observation that I think is, again, pretty obvious. As we grow up and as we go through the world, what we see as available choices to us changes over time. Think of a kid, right, six or seven years old, and the way that they plan for their day and maybe their week. They have no concept of long-term planning, right? If you ask a seven-year-old, where do you see yourself in five years, right? Either the seven-year-old is gonna just kind of look at you quizzically or say something predictably ridiculous. Like, of course, that's not going to be the case that you're an astronaut in five years, seven-year-old. Uh, but I don't know, maybe Elon Musk will prove me wrong on that one. Uh, but, you know, as, as the seven-year-old grows up and becomes, say, someone in his or her mid-twenties, they have a concept of long-term planning. They're able to make decisions that reach years into the future. Even if they're pretty bad at that kind of long-term planning, they have a concept of it, right? So as we grow up and as we learn to see the world and our place in it differently, we see different choices as available to ourselves, right? But here's the conclusion that we can draw now. If it's the case that video games should be reflecting the choices we see as available to ourselves, and also that the choices we see as available to ourselves change as we grow up, if a series is trying to draw back the same people, especially if they're initially children when they're first drawn into the series, it had better be the case that subsequent entries in that series, just in virtue of this argument, actually change what's available uh, to the player to reflect their changed view on the world and the choices they see as available to themselves. And so if that's not the case in the series, that's another kind of gap that we can look to and try to fill with this kind of analytical fan fiction. And that's exactly the kind of gap um, Jaren and CJ and I think uh, that we see in the Legend of Zelda series, uh, which is where I'm going to turn it over to them to pivot from this more broad theory stuff to talk about how they went about um, building a work of fan fiction in this style with the Zelda series to fill in probably the, the most commonly pointed to gap in the Zelda series. So with that, guys, I'm going to turn it over to you. What is up, PAX East? How are we doing on this Thursday? First Thursday. How many of you guys is this your first PAX? Awesome. Me too. So that's pretty dope, actually. Um, a little nervous. I don't know if you can tell. Um, I just wanted to thank you guys for coming out. I know for a lot of you, this panel was probably addressed with a lot of skepticism. Uh, you know, can fan fiction really be this valuable? Um, I'm stoked that you guys are here. I hope that we can convince you of that. Um, we'll go ahead and start into uh, what we're going to talk about here today. <clears throat> we're going to be talking about specifically whether or not fan fiction can be used to teach us anything about the legend of Zelda. <clears throat> We'll start by talking about some general fan fiction stuff, kind of set a, a base ground of understanding. Uh, we'll talk about how and why we began writing this Hero of Time story that we've been talking about. Um, and then we'll start to, uh, talking about some of the specifics, you know, what can it teach us about the fans, about the developers, and about the games. Uh, and then finally, we'll kind of tie all of that back into why Hero of Time is the way it is, and why we chose to approach it in the ways that we did. Um, before we get too far into it, I want to let you guys know we're not going to be standing up here and just pitching you our fan fiction, uh, so don't expect to get a bunch of the story pieces from it. I know that's not why you're here. Um, it's mostly going to be talking about the analytical aspects. <clears throat> so, 
to introduce ourselves, right? My name is Jaron R.M. Johnson. I'm a writer and analyst for With a Terrible Fate. Um, I love Wes Anderson films, and I write fan fiction. Hi, Jaron. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Hello, Pax. Uh, I'm CJ. I am also an, an analyst for With a Terrible Fate, and um, I write fan fiction. <laughs> Hi, Colin. <laughs> So, who here in this crowd loves The Legend of Zelda? It's good, great, awesome, cool. Who here in this crowd loves fan fiction as much as they love Legend of Zelda? That's less, that's less people. That's way less people. <laughs> this guy gets it. This guy gets it. That's what's <laughs> uh, So fan, th there's, there's a good reason for that, too. Fan fiction is, as Aaron said, deeply personal. Um, and part of it being even personal is that fan fiction can be written by anybody. And that can mean that it can be very good, and that can be something else sometimes. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we've actually seen a lot of that, haven't we? I, I, yes. I'm trying to think of some few. I think we've seen some really bad Harry Potter fan fiction. <laughs> oh, no. what, what, what do you think about here? We've seen some bad Sonic fan fiction. Oh, there was some bad Sonic fan fiction, wasn't there? Do you have any other ones, man? Uh, Super Smash Brothers. Oh, there was a Super, Super Smash, Smash Brothers, Brothers fan fiction. Fan fiction. Yes. And then, and this is my favorite, there was this other fan fiction, I don't know if you guys know, it was originally a Twilight no, fan no, fiction, no, no, and no. it got adapted yeah. into a movie. No, we're not doing that. I made slides. I, 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 I told you we weren't doing I made a lot. I made a lot of slides. <laughs> some of our own perceptions to other people. Uh, I feel pretty strongly that this is the case, and if CJ and Aaron both do too, uh, and we're pretty stoked thinking that hopefully by the end of this presentation we'll convince you guys as well. So to kick off our, our fan fiction steeped conversation, I have a terrible confession to make about, uh, about my opinions on the Legend of Zelda series, and that is that I don't like Skyward Sword. I'm sorry. No. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know. I'm allowed You're to be bad. wrong. I'm allowed to be wrong. It's my right, I think. But uh, I didn't like it. It was not my favorite game. And personally, when it came out, I thought the Legend of Zelda series was dead. Like, like really dead. Dead like good Star Wars games. Dead. Just dead. 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 I'm sorry. I'm working through some things. <laughs> Uh, and this eventually led me to uh, set out on kind of a little hypothetical quest of mine uh, when I was a young, emerging writer. Um, you were so cute, cute then. What happened? I know. <laughs> which was, I wanted to set, I wanted to write the perfect Zelda sequel. That's what I really wanted. Um, and I think it was, back then it was because I wanted to, I, I just, I wanted to know that it was possible. And it, it was, because I didn't know it was possible at the time. <laughs> not to say that what, I, that what we've got up here is perfect. That's, that's not what I'm trying to say. That slide so, was perfect. Huh? That slide was perfect. That slide was perfect. It was beautiful. So, uh, we, Jaren and I, I got with Jaren here, we set up to, to create this hypothetical sequel. And over passing the point back and forth over a few years, um, we eventually did come up with our own very shameful uh, fan fiction about Legend of Zelda. Uh, not, not, not something that I intended to just be a written story that I'll post on Reddit or something like that, but I wanted, I wanted a game. I wrote like a, I, I wanted to write like a full game. Young and stupid. Um, as opposed to old and stupid. <laughs> now, we, we, we wrote the original version of this story, which has been years ago now. Uh, we kind of filled up a lot of these contradictory hopes and dreams for kind of what we wanted. Uh, we, we wanted to have a game that sort of took us back into our childhood. Uh, the first Zelda game that we played, which, as I'm sure for a lot of you guys here in this crowd, Ocarina of Time, 
right? A lot of us wanted to recapture some of the game moments that we had playing that because it was really valuable to us. But not only did we want to kind of, you know, go back in time and kind of relive that childhood, which, as we'll talk about later, is a little unrealistic, we also wanted this game to sort of take the series into the future. We wanted a way to kind of like look at the direction that it's going and maybe just overcorrect the steering just a little bit. Um, what's cool is, thanks to Aaron, we've had an opportunity to start telling this story and to refine the ideas that we use in this story uh, on the website with a terrible fate. Uh, we've been running this article series here over time where we're doing a lot of what we're doing right now, which is just kind of walking you guys through some of the decisions that we made and some of the ways that we approach these tactics. Um, I am super stoked about this opportunity. It's obviously brought me here to you guys. You guys think I'm hilarious, right? Yes. So yeah, that's no, awesome, I think, for all no. of us. <laughs> <clears throat> so writing it gave us a better understanding of the series as a whole, um, which is really, really valuable to us. But not only did it give us a better understanding of the series as a whole, it gave us a better understanding of kind of what we expected out of the series, what was and wasn't realistic. Um, and it also gave us a heightened understanding of kind of the, the large fan base that it has and some of the really interesting aspects of that fan base. Um, and we're, we're really stoked to share some of the stuff that we've learned. So part of, our, part of our understanding comes from writing fan fiction. Part of it also comes from reading fan fiction. Um, and it's to give us these kind of generalizations that we can make about uh, the fans and the developers. So fan fiction can teach us about the fans of the series. Take the Sonic fan base. Please, please take. That's not what I meant. <laughs> um, in the Sonic fan base, creating original characters is a really popular trend nowadays. Um, and again, that's something that anybody can do, so the quality can, can range up and down. And sometimes it can come out a little bit special. Sometimes it's amazing. Have you guys seen this? Don't take any photos, by the way. This is an original character. I would hate it if you guys stole it. Don't you see the copyright down there. No photos. <laughs> but this, this popular trend is something in which, when you, when you play a Sonic fan game, if you've made your own original character, and I'm not saying that we haven't done this, Jared, um, but when you play a Sonic uh, game, your perception of that game is colored by your own original character, whether you realize it or not. Uh, maybe you're in a slow part of the game, and what you've done, you begin to do in your head, is create a little side story for yourself. And when enough people do have these colored perceptions of the game, it, it, it's never truly concrete, but it may eventually become worth acknowledging to the developers, who, been, who eventually was it, recently, uh, released the game Sonic Forces. I forgot the name of that game for a minute. Sonic <laughs> Forces, which allows you to create your own characters, such as Cold, Cold Steel. Cold Steel. Yeah, that's, that's, it's important to note that, you know, for, for the fans that write this fan fiction, we're, we're not saying that, you know, everyone who creates a Sonic OC, myself with standing here, uh, has this expectation, right, that their character really exists in the canon. That's, that's a little unrealistic. I, I think a lot of people understand that, you know, that's not the case. Um, but that, that OC, that original character, does exist somewhere in their mind. And as they play these games, as they move through these series, that, that little itch is in the back of their head saying, you know, well, well what, would, what would Cold Steel be doing right now? You know, what, what would he do to react to the situation? How would the situation be different if, if Cold Steel were there to save the day? Um, and I think that that expectation is, like Colin said, occasionally worth acknowledging to the developers. Just, just, to, just to bounce off that real quick, I think even for developers who more or less claim not to listen to their fans, Nintendo, um, <laughs> that, that the, 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 your opinions as fans, our opinions as fans, I guess I'm a fan too, but, um, <laughs> they matter. Whether, whether or not they want to acknowledge them or not, our opinions will eventually color the perceptions of the developers who make these games. So just keep that in mind. So, you know, what does that mean for fans of the Zelda series? Um, as, fans of, uh, as fans of Ocarina of Time and of Majora's Mask, uh, this, this recapturing our childhood is a very, very common theme for us uh, and for a lot of fans. You know, when, when you first experience the Zelda series uh, and, and the, the way that it's sort of unique in, in its story, in its mythos, in the way that you play through the game and constantly solve these puzzles on, on a continuous adventure, it, for a lot of us, kind of hits home. Um, we, we watched Nintendo over the years kind of try again and again to recapture the magic that happened with Ocarina of Time with Majora's Mask, and their attempts were, were sort of failing over and over again. Twilight Princess, a lot of people claimed, was almost a carbon copy of Ocarina of Time, 
Um, and, and once we really started thinking about the fact that Nintendo themselves could not recapture the magic that they had created in those games for us, we sort of had to address the, the idea that maybe we were expecting too much from Nintendo. Maybe expecting them to recapture our childhoods and then force feed it back to us was just a little bit unrealistic. Now, that's not to say that we, we thought we had to like lower ex our expectations. I would never I would never approach another fan and say, I think you just need to accept a slightly crappier game. <laughs> no one wants that. But that is as as a as a viewer, that was the moment in which I had realized I had to place my own expectations in reality and realize that I was we were never going to capture lightning in a bottle again, as as uh, Mark Hamill has said multiple times about the Last Jedi, for instance. We're never going to capture the same feeling that we had the first time. It just, you can't really do it unless you clone yourself. But that's not, that's a different discussion. So, uh, so fan fiction uh, also teaches us about the developers of the series. Um, Legend of Zelda pulls from another number of myths and legends from all around the world, um, from, from the east to the west, uh, considering that it's, it's a game made by Japanese developers, but largely emulates Western culture uh, most of the time. Uh, the Master Sword, for instance, is, it resembles heavily Excalibur from The Legend of King Arthur. Uh, the Ocarina of Time from Ocarina of Time is, also resembles the Pied Piper, who could charm rats uh, and children, I believe, with his song. Um, and then there are other cultural influences from Japan. Kakariko Village from Breath of the Wild takes on a very heavy Japanese theme, as well as creatures such as the Rito, the, the bird people, who resemble the Tengu, who are also from Japanese legend. Um, and the, the purpose of this is, for one thing, all, all fantasy. If, if you just read fantasy in general, Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, all fantasy is, is more or less tied back to mythology and legend, and in many ways is sort of like our own like modern fan fiction of things that people wrote thousands of years ago. So modern fantasy, fan fiction of mythology, and then ours, a fan fiction of, fan, of fantasy. And so it made sense to kind of crawl back up, up the river to, to the original source for inspiration. We felt that that would help us make a better story, was to understand where everything came from. And, and in studying a lot of these things, uh, and in studying the, the inspirations that the developers took in order to create this game, we also learned what some of these developers really value in the series. Uh, and ultimately, what we realized from studying what the developers value in the series is that this is unfortunately very often not in line with what a lot of the fans seem to be calling out for. Um, a lot of the fans see some of these recurring themes and characters in these games, and, and they, you know, when, when they started in the series for us, when we started Not Green of Time, we saw all of Hyrule, we saw the Kokiri Forest, we saw the Deku Tree, and, you know, the, the, the story impacted us in, in a way that, that kind of shifted the way that we went through life, right? So as we grew older, as we matured, we started thinking about some of the stories that, that we've seen in the Zelda series, not just in the beginning, but some of the other stories. We see Kokiri Forest popping up, uh, pop up in other games. We see opponent present in other games. We, we see all of these different items and, and things pop up in these other games, and we start to wonder, you know, how are these connected? We, we kind of, as, as we grow up and, and mature, we want a more mature understanding of the Zelda universe. We're not just satisfied with, you know, oh, it's a sequel. We say, you know, well, how did it go from this to this? In this game, Hyrule Castle is here, but in this game, it's moved over here, and, and this culture is different, you know? And, and ultimately, what that led to was uh, the creation of the Hyrule Historia in 2011. Uh, how many of you guys here own or have read the Hyrule Historia? That is awesome. That is awesome. That is awesome to see. Um, so a lot of you then will know that this was released right in line with Skyward Sword, which is a fantastic Zelda game. And uh, <laughs> one of the primary functions of the Hyrule Historia which is actually, in my experience, one of the only situations where Nintendo has done a sort of really, really obvious fan service, was the timeline that they released. And this timeline uses chronology to tie each and every one of these Zelda games together and to state, you know, here's why this happened this way. It's because in this previous game, this happened this way. It gives us a concept of cause and effect that we can use to measure the relationships from one game to the next. Now, 
a lot of people will use this, uh, this timeline not only to guide their understanding of the series, but like we've done, to generate their own fan content, whether that be theories about the series or fan fictions. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, though, you can't really use that timeline to generate your ideas about the next game. In 2017, Edgy Numa did this interview uh, talking about Breath of the Wild, and he states essentially that he doesn't want to be tied up and chained up and forced to write a new Zelda game in any way, shape, or form just based on the way the previous Zelda games were. He views that as an obstacle, as a blocker, and he, he wants to avoid that at all, at all times. He, he wants to leave those games in the past, which is kind of almost the exact opposite of what a lot of fans seem to want. A lot of fans want to recapture and relive those moments, whereas the developers say, no, let's just, let's just make a new game, let's pander to a new audience, let's grow the crowd, rather than kind of paying respects to, to some fans of the, of the series the way you know, Star Wars. <clears throat> so knowing that they don't use the timeline, to create their new games. That tells us that we can't use the timeline to understand their new games. And ultimately, he puts the onus of kind of placing these games in the timeline on the fans. Uh, later on in the interview, he basically states, you know, I want to leave it to the fans to, to figure out where it goes in the timeline. Which essentially means that Nintendo has nullified the timeline. The timeline is fan fiction. The timeline has absolutely no merit to the canon because the developers, when writing the games, don't consider it as a piece of the canon. Uh, this, this creates uh, this huge dissonance between the developers and the fans that I think it was already there, but this, this interview was probably the moment that it was the most highlighted for me. And I think that that dissonance, that disconnect between the developers and the fans, is probably the series' weakest link, uh, pun. You'll, you'll see that in Star Wars, they, they do a lot of work with reintroducing some of these really home-hitting moments with having Chewie and Han Solo walk back on the Falcon and say, you know, we're home. But this series, all it, uh, the, the most that I think we've ever seen in this series is, you know, small cameos that, that aren't really emotionally impactful in any way, or, you know, musical cameos. Not that any of us don't appreciate the music in Zelda. <clears throat> so, the development of this timeline effectively backfired for them which is really unfortunate. Uh, this quote also directly shows that while uh, fans, fans like myself, and I hope fans like, like you guys, uh, idolize these older games and use this timeline as pretty much our reference tool to understand those older games, the developers would, would rather leave all this in the past and, they, and, and move past it as a useful tool to, uh, for, for writing. So ultimately, that brings us to the question of what do the fans want out of this series, right? What, what value do the fans want to get from this series? This kind of brings us to the point of discussing the gap between the series that there is. So when we realized that the, there was this, this uh, gap between Nintendo and the fans, the, the, the dissonance between the development and between uh, fan service essentially, uh, we sort of knew that we were on the right track to, to write in that direction, to write towards trying to mend that gap. Uh, we looked at a lot of other fan stories, as I unfortunately said before. Um, we also uh, looked at some of the core concepts that we thought made Zelda, Zelda. Um, and these concepts, these concepts, excuse me, steered our writing, uh, and one of the biggest indications between other, other works of fan fiction was uh, that people were super interested in the 100 year time gap between Majora's Mask and Twilight Princess. It's like a hundred and change. You know, you know what I mean. Uh, that gap isn't just a canonical gap. There's also a thematic gap there. Uh, because Majora's Mask is a direct sequel to Ocarina of Time, we, we look at that as being the two first edition, uh, the two first entries in an unfinished trilogy. So now there's a thematic gap. In being, there, there's, a, there's a piece of the structure there that's missing. It's just a void of, please write me. What, what's funny and, and kind of neat is uh, a lot of fans have already kind of said that same thing. A lot of fans do want to explore that gap. Um, that, that gap existing between those two games 
Uh, and, and it's kind of unsurprising that they want to explore that because Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, and Twilight Princess were some of the most successful titles in the series. Um, you'll, you'll see this is a, a mock-up of a ROM hack that was made. Someone basically took the game of Ocarina of Time uh, and rewrote it to be uh, that, you know, uh, that unfinished final chapter of the trilogy. Uh, Voyager of Time takes place as Link returns to Hyrule, um, and what's really cool and admirable about Voyager of Time is that it was created by a fan who had no coding experience, had no, no any kind of, uh, you know, digital programming experience, and for them it was just that they were so driven by this passion to tell this story that they said, I don't care if I don't know anything about this, I, I'm literally only going to learn this because I desperately want to tell this story. I think there's so much value to this story that, you know, I, I need to tell this story. I'm going to do what it takes to tell this story. So when we realized that, you know, all these people also wanted to tell the story, it told us, yeah, we were probably on the right track in, in the story that we wanted to tell. And, and, and hats off to you guys for that. Hats off to, like, just, just Zelda fans in general for, like, stuff like this. We, I, I, I feel like Star Trek and Star Wars fans get all the credit for being rabid, foaming at the mouth, crazed out fans, but we are, we're a close third. And I'm, I'm very proud. Um, it, was around, it was around ideas that, like this that our own story began to take shape. We knew that our story was going to involve an adult Link returning to Hyrule from his, from his journey to find Bambi, uh, and that it was, we, uh, we wanted to, you know, to be big, to be final, because it, it was going to include a lot of themes, but we also knew that it couldn't just be a business as usual, you know, go to the castle, fight again, blow stuff up, everyone wins. We, we knew that in order for this to be special, Legend of Zelda would have to do the one thing that it hadn't done for a long time and only recently started doing with Breath of the Wild, and that is evolve. You see, in studying the Legend of Zelda, uh, we, we sort of missed one of the crucial points in the story, and it is funny to, to tell you guys this and to admit to you guys that we somehow missed this, because it is, it is arguably the key point of the Zelda series, and that is the story doesn't change. From game to game to game, the story is told in an almost completely cyclical, copy and paste way. And that's not just something that Zelda does, you know, in kind of service to his fans, or that Nintendo does because the formula works. They do that because it's actually a part of the story. This, this Zelda cycle, where, you know, the hero is reincarnated just in time to catch, you know, the, the evil guy rising to power, and the hero guy rises to power and takes him down with the combination of wisdom and courage, this, this is a key component in the Zelda series. This is a wildly important aspect of the Zelda series. Uh, so going back to my apparently unpopular opinions of Skyward Sword, one, one of the issues that I had with that game was that it tried too hard to explain where all this came from. This just isn't here. There's a mystery here. And I think by trying to begin this cycle, the Nintendo broke it in that game. So, and, and, and you can't break the cycle and, 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 and still have a Zelda game that feels like an effective Zelda game. So, in, in our own story, while our goal was never to break the cycle, we, did, we didn't know we had to bend the cycle just a little bit, which is kind of one of those tightrope of, of writing hacks. So one day we came. So, so one day, actually, like like four or five years ago now, we I came across this next image here. Uh, this is it. it uh, this is a render made by an artist named David Canderley that was shown at Comic Con 2010. Uh, this is Link as we have never seen him before in the Legend of Zelda series, as 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 an old man, as a really old man. Seeing this image of of the hero of time kind of falling victim to time in the long run gave us the answers to questions that we had not yet been asking. It, it told us so much in, in such a very simple image. It, it kind of like revealed all of this, you know, mysticism that like Colin was talking about, you know, what, what does happen to him after Majora's Mask? I mean, does he return to Hyrule? What, what happens? And we saw this link, it was, it was almost immediate. We saw this and we thought, you know, this, this is the link that we want to see more of. This concept of link is what we want to explore. And we knew immediately that this was how we were going to tell our story in a way that evolved the canon while still staying true to its roots, while paying respect to all of the fans, and, and kind of like letting the series grow up with the fans, and then completing that trilogy. This was the link that we were going to use for Hero of Time. This, uh, so this idea kind of hit, this hit me like a ton of bricks 
if you, if you can imagine, I was uh, in, our, in our smelly apartment, I was just <laughs> yelling at Jaren all day about this idea. It was compelling to me. And a part of, it, was, it, was, it was compelling because it was a marriage between, you know, uh, interesting, like, like fun action adventure game, but also compelling spiritual journey for the player. Uh, I believe at one point, the, the, the compelling theme expansion that I wanted was that as the hero of time, that he wouldn't just be the hero who uses time to save the day, but now he is the hero who has conquered it, which was just a really powerful idea to me. Um, and ultimately, what we began writing was a love letter to Legend of Zelda. This, this vision of, of Old Man Link is meant to be a direct metaphorical connection to a lot of the fans of the series who have grown up over the years with the series. We, we know that a lot of the series, you know, a lot of the fans of it, we, we look back at Ocarina and we think, God, has it really been 20 years? Has it been that long? You know, we, the polygons seemed so much less obvious back then. I don't know if my <laughs> eyes have gotten better or not. Uh, and, and so that metaphorical connection, that growing up Link with the player, provides this new connection to Link that is really, really important in the series that kind of gets lost over time. <clears throat> this, this is uh, a YouTube comment that we pulled off of the original soundtrack um, for Ocarina of Time, and we kind of saw that this, this fan echoes a lot of the sentiments that a lot of fans write. Um, it's, it's a little long-winded, but, but shortening it is, is this guy basically explaining that he was so deeply connected to Ocarina of Time as a kid that the moment that he felt that connection break, his childhood felt like it was that, that was the moment that his childhood was officially over. It, it was kind of this realization that drove us, right? You can never go back to that moment. You can never recapture that lightning in a bottle. All you can do is move forward with the series and try to do it in a way that doesn't necessarily recapture that lightning in a bottle, but maybe something else. I can't believe we didn't write a bottle joke. That is amazing to me. What a missed opportunity. I'm leaving. <laughs> um, so I'm looking at my notes, and something that I should have mentioned earlier was that as far as the age range of Zelda characters, something that I forgot to mention was that uh, one of the initial challenges that we were running into is that because of the different ages of Zelda fans, the Zelda, the Zelda fan base has a massive, massive age range, uh, larger than most other series. And that means that there are multiple kinds of Zelda fans out there, but it's they good. pretty much all sound like this. <laughs> and again, please don't feel ashamed because I, th this is just me and Jaren. This is, this, is, this is us, colorized, 1942. Uh, <laughs> but uh, growing up personally, because I am, I, am, I am an adult, I like to tell myself that, growing up personally has made Legend of Zelda less relatable to me. And that's really sad. Uh, look around the room, for instance. They're not actually looking around the room, look at each other. Disrespect. Disrespectful. <laughs> some, of us are, some of us are getting up there in age, not trying to point anyone out. <laughs> but... <laughs> So, uh, playing Breath of, the Wild, Breath of the Wild, for instance, loved Breath of the Wild. Please don't hate me. That's not criticism. I hate you. But, oh, cool, thanks. But uh, playing Breath of the Wild as a 17-year-old kid who's, you know, five foot two and like maybe 100 pounds soaking wet, climbing mountains, killing monsters, never getting an ounce of muscle, that was, that was weird to me. It was really weird to me. And a little unrelatable because I, I knew that 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 image of Link was meant to play towards a younger crowd. And that was a younger crowd that I could, I could simply no longer identify with. Um, Link has always been a child in, in every Zelda game. Even the games in which we, we have a colloquial adult Link, he's, in Ocarina of Time, he's 14. In Breath of the Wild, he's 17. He's never, he's never truly an adult in, the, in these games. And that's an intentional choice on the part of, of the developers but looking around this room at pretty much all of you, we are not children anymore. I'm a child. Most of us are not children anymore. <laughs> I'm also a child, I'm sorry. <laughs> you write fan fiction, we're all children. <laughs> uh, and that, so, so playing Breath of the Wild like that, that created a disconnection that I, I, never, I never expected to feel, and I was, I was heartbroken. Uh, so, at first, the idea that was meant to simply fill, fill a canonical ga a gap became uh, a teaching moment. And right in the year of time, 
taught me several important things. And just to kind of go back over what, what, we've, what we've been over, Riding New Hero Time taught me about the fans, that we really do care about the established world and theme of Zelda. And that things like that, this, this timeline, this is where we live. Uh, it taught me about the developers who, who, who don't live with that timeline, who, who care more about uh, gameplay, memorable gameplay experiences, which is uh, an admirable goal, uh, but they do so even at the cost of the story and the quality of that story. And lastly, it taught me about source fiction itself, which is that Legend of Zelda is not perfect, which is really hard to say on stage in front of like what I'm pretty sure is 100 people. <laughs> but Legend of Zelda is not perfect. So, for, for me, and, I, and I'm hoping for Jaren too, let, uh, this, this Hero of Time project has been a chance for Legend of Zelda to, it's been a chance to be better, to be better as fans, and to be better as a series. Uh, a chance to not only fill a canonical gap, but to also fill a gap in player experience with Link. And, the, and the, that gap in our experience with Link is that we never got the chance to grow up with Link. Uh, and a good example of, of, of why this is important, think of the new Star Wars movies. We talk about Star Wars way too much, this is a problem. <laughs> Read our articles, and like, every article has a Star Wars reference. I'm disgusted. Um, but in The Last Jedi, uh, not The Last Jedi, The Force Awakens, we talked about Han and Chewie walking on the Millennium Falcon, what we call the we're home moment. And that is basically the, the moment that, that, that moment wasn't just for those characters. For those of you who, who like Star Wars, you're in here, right? For those of you who like Star Wars, that moment was for you. That moment was the kind of the, the, the pain and anguish and the waiting time and the joy of a generation of Star Wars fans. In two words. So why can't Legend of Zelda grow up with us? Why can't it be about growing up? Not just like, and not like, not like dark growing up. We're not gonna go like Christopher Nolan, Dark Knight, like, where's the princess? <laughs> Why so seriously? <laughs> but don't tempt me. Um, who here imagined Tinkle was the Joker? So, <laughs> me too. So when I get home, I have some, some, some new fan fiction to write. <laughs> So it, for, for us, this is what, what, I, uh, what we've been trying to write and what we may not accomplish, but hopefully we'll accomplish, is writing a story that is about, it's about Link, it's about Zelda, it's about the series as a whole, and it's about us, the fans who grew up with Legend of Zelda. That, for us and for you guys, is where Hero of Time begins. It's a new story, and it's written by fans, and it's written with the collective fan base in mind trying to not recapture the lightning in a bottle that is impossible to do, but to take the series in a direction that answers a lot of our questions and that speaks volumes to where we are in our lives. That is where Hero of Time begins, and for us, that's where our presentation at PAX East ends. Uh, I'm thanking you guys so much for, for dealing with all these jokes. I think they were very bad. I'm gonna go ahead and pass the mic off to Aaron, and we can shoot through some Q&A. So thank you guys very much for listening. Q&A, uh, I need to plug, we are here uh, again today and then tomorrow. If you liked what you heard, we're talking about two entirely different topics uh, and two more panels. So if you want to think about the great books of video games, what it means to build a video game canon and what games belong in that canon, we're going to be doing all that at 5.30 p.m. today in Bumblebee. Be there, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, tomorrow at 2.30 p.m., also in Bumblebee, we're going to be thinking about all the many ways that video games have been innovating uh, episodic storytelling uh, and thinking about things like does DLC actually matter to the storytelling of video games, uh, what effect does mythos have on video games, things like this. So if you're interested, please come to those. Um, if you want to head out before Q&A, that's okay, this is the time. Uh, and before we jump into Q&A, I think we're going to do a little selfie with the crowd because we want to integrate all of the fans uh, into our own storytelling, as we've been talking at you about for the last um, 45 minutes or so. You make it sound like such a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs>
If you want to chat, jump in. Anything about Zelda, fan fiction, um, other things related to video games. Don't everyone run up at once. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the mic? Oh, it's, sorry, right it's right there. It's right there. Eric, yeah. He's getting there. So I was looking over here for But uh, when you were doing the whole uh, cycle of reincarnation thing, where it sort of started with uh, Link being reincarnated and the evil developing, there is another common thread, which is usually the Master Sword, which always appears in every story. So I was wondering if you put special thought into that as well, as a part of that cycle, and how adult Link, who would probably have the Master Sword, how he would deal with passing it on to the next generation or making it ready. Uh, we did. Um... And that's sort of one of the sensitive details of the plot. However, um, a big part of what I was thinking about when I, when I sort of wrote that section of the story was um, there was a lot of setup to do for the next game, which was Twilight Princess. Um, a, lot of, a lot of what I was thinking about was how to connect Ocarina of Time to Twilight Princess and then still see how much room I had in between. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't think how much I can get away with here. <laughs> it's stealth. I think the thing that I wanted to play with was um, kind of looking at the relationship, the relationship between Link and the Master Sword a little bit, a little bit differently, which is a little closer to um, a little like how Breath of the Wild did it, but with a twist. And that was Breath of the Wild makes you wait a really long time before you get the Master Sword, because it took me forever to get those thirteen hearts worth of those. Stupid shrines. Um, and, and it's got this great whole, like you go back to the Koro Forest, there's some nostalgia, there's the, there's the, there's the Deku Tree. It's, it's, it's a great callback to older games. But the one thing that I think the game was missing was that there should have, for an older Link who has already wielded the Master Sword, there should be a personal relationship between him and this more or less inanimate object. Um, kind of as a, a because it's symbolic to him of, you know, days gone by, but also to, you know, essentially his, his greater destiny. So, yes, yeah, the, the short answer is yes. <laughs> uh, another thing that we kind of used in approaching that was, uh, when we wrote this, right, the primary things that we were looking at were facts in the game, within the game. So we know for a fact where the Master Sword is at the end of Ocarina of Time, and we know for a fact where it is in Twilight Princess. So all we really did was try and figure out a way to connect those things in a way that makes sense while still telling what we felt was an authentic story. Which kind of begs the question, and I, I'm sure this answer is different for everyone, can you tell a Zelda story without the Master Sword and, and make it really good? Um, I won't tell you whether or not that's our story, but I will tell you that this is something that we thought a lot about. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you talked about the Zelda timeline and how Nintendo has officially said we don't really look at that for new games. So, and that it's basically now fan fiction. How do you, where, where do you place Breath of the Wild in that, in your view? So, um, I kind of have, I, I'm kind of about two opinions about this. Um, my first opinion is that I, I, I was sort of personally outraged <laughs> the idea that, that Nintendo doesn't consider the timeline when they build games. They just build games and then they the hope that us as fans that we'll do the heavy lifting as far as lore and, and canon for them. Um, and as much as I love Nintendo, personally that's, that's not a great move in my, that's in my opinion. So my first answer would be that I don't know 
and don't care. But my second opinion as a uh, Zelda fan who can't help himself is uh, that I would honestly go back up to Skyward Sword and then draw lines sideways. <laughs> and Breath of the Wild is over here. And the reason I would do that is because of Breath of the Wild, mostly it's the religion aspect of Breath of the Wild. You know the, the how they, they switch over to the goddess Hylia, and they never mention the three go the golden goddesses from uh, what we know, A Link to the Past, and then um, Ocarina of Time. I know what I'm talking about. Um, so that, that's a big indicator that there's a huge religious shift there. Um, and I think that's, it's, it's one of those things where they don't acknowledge it at all in later sections of the timeline, because as you go throughout the timeline, the games get older, um, especially on the, the, the Heroes Fallen timeline, that one. That's where all like, the Nintendo, like, and Nintendo Entertainment System games belong, is the Heroes Fallen timeline. No mention of the goddess Hylia. So, again, to me, I think it represents a completely different timeline. Um, where... Oh. <laughs> That's, that's a timer. Um, and I, I say that because I also think that, that Nintendo will continue to develop games with this same trend continuing in that direction unintentionally. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Thanks. Good afternoon. What's up, man? So, you mentioned the, the gap between Majora's Mask and Twilight Princess where your fanfiction has been focusing. With, and you said you've read a number of fan fictions. Now, I'm sure that they're all over the place, but there seem to be any sort of clusters of time frames or subject matters or between games or gaps that are really popular of as back Yeah, um, Yeah, so one thing that we see a lot of, um, and this is, this is kind of funny uh, to say, we see a lot of people kind of looking at some of the religious aspects and trying to answer some of the questions like, where did it begin? Where did it start? That's what a lot of the simpler ROM hacks that I've seen are, and, and most of these games are ROM hacks, a lot of them of the, the 2D Zelda games. Um, if you, where, where we found a lot of them was uh, the Zelda Wiki actually has a list of some of the most popular fan fiction, right? Uh, there's an entire section that's dedicated primarily to games orbiting Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, and Twilight Princess. It's probably because the hardware for those is the most accessible to build for. Um, the engines that you would use to build on those systems. Life in Ocarina of Time and in Majora's Mask. And then this thing happens in Twilight Princess, where he appears as the hero's shade. And even if people weren't thinking that initially, Nintendo said as much in the Hyrule Historia. Yes, the hero of shade, uh, the hero of time is the hero's shade. Um, but there's this weird distance between the hero of shades, the hero of time's, wow, all right, that's just what he is. Hero of shades, existence in Time Limited and Twilight Princess, on the one hand, but then also the fact that because you're not playing as him, whereas you played as the Hero of Time in Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, it doesn't feel like a conclusion to that trilogy. And I think that speaks to a broader idea that if you're trying to really flesh out a trilogy uh, in a series like Legend of Zelda, you have to sort of center it on the same character as the Avatar, right? There's a sense, I think, um, that you guys feel, and that I do too, that you know, Nintendo kind of skipped right from the third entry in that trilogy to the epilogue in Twilight Princess, which I think is what invites a lot of fans to say, well, we need that third game in the trilogy. Thank you. And after this, I think we're gonna have to wrap up, but uh, like I said, we'll be outside if you want to chat us up more. All right, uh, hi. I, uh, you talking about, uh, anyways, um, you were talking about how you might like to see a older Link in some of the future Zelda games, and yeah, there has been a lot of younger Links, you know, like 17, 13, whatever, but um, how do you think fans would react to that? Because I, I personally feel like it would take away from sort of the childish feel of playing Legend of Zelda. Uh, so that is something that I ran into with this guy when I first proposed the idea, and I think it would be an extremely polarizing idea. I don't know. I'd like no one idea is for everybody, is, is previously taken away there. Um, how I think fans would react to the event that, let's say, tomorrow, Nintendo announced an old man Link game. Um, you guys remember Wind Waker? Would it be like that? Pretty much. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think if they announced it tomorrow, there'd be a lot of doubt, a lot of anger, a lot of fear, and a lot of dark side stuff, in, including for me. I think it's. Like, like I'm, the, I'm the person writing this, and I know that it's a dangerous idea, because it's super easy to screw up. So, yeah.
I get, I get, I get your, I get your doubts on the issue. Yeah, I mean, you know, I was just like, more wondering what you think from your perspective, being on the nose of the planet. Which, mm -hmm. but, like, I'm just. You know, all right, gang, we should wrap up here because uh, it's time. Uh, but like I said, uh, thank you so much for coming. We've got two more panels. Uh, if you're interested, check us out. Uh